what risk do you see in real estate investing and how have you been able to mitigate those risks, JT? Well, the main risk is getting stuck with a property you can't sell or one that's not cash flow positive, something that you're going to lose money on. You want to make sure that that does not happen. And the main way of doing that is to get the proper education as to how to evaluate a deal so that you can make sure going into that, that project, that purchase, that deal, that your numbers are sound so that you're not going to lose your shirt. You want to make sure that if you're going to make a mistake, it's a small mistake, something that you can learn from and continue on from. You don't want to do anything catastrophic that's going to knock you out of the game or cause you to have to file bankruptcy or something of that nature. Mm, good point. Good point. So, because, you know, a lot, a lot of people have this, like, stereotype that real estate is very risky. But you make a good point that, you know, when you know what you're doing and when you understand the system, you know, and you have a good system in place, then you really do mitigate those risks. Okay. I would okay. always say to get started now, Yeah. do it now, but make mm. sure that the numbers that you're going into the deal are those that are cash flow positive. Even when I do a flip, mm -hmm. I have a plan B exit whereby right. I am going to be able to make that property into a rental if I can't sell it for a profitable price and still be cash flow positive. Bingo. We do that as well. Yeah. We just um, we just got an apartment building in Southeast, which was really cool. And we did all the analysis in the neighborhood and all that to see, um, just to make sure that, you know, um, the renters that we put in there will be able to cover the mortgage. And we did think, we, we weren't thinking this going in, but we um, now we're knowing, we, we kind of are going towards, sec if Section 8, you know, the area can be Section 8 or it can be open market. But what I'm seeing is a lot of open market rentals aren't that secure right now. Um, so are you any thoughts on that? Like rental, do you usually rent, do you, do you target your rentals to a certain demographic? I do accept Section 8 rentals. About half my portfolio is Section 8. And when COVID hit, it was a certain comfort to knowing if nothing else, I was going to get this amount of money from those tenants that had the government subsidy. Um, in my case, in Durham, North Carolina, thankfully the Section 8 program has run pretty well and it pays at or above, in some cases, market rents. So it's the no brainer in this market to do Section 8. In some other areas, it may not pay market rent or it may not be run effectively. So you have to just evaluate it on a city by city basis. So what I'm hearing is that, you know, even if you, you know, you, if you plan to do a flip, but the backup plan, if the market goes down, is just to hold it as a rental. Lorenia, is that, is, so is that basically your yeah. backup plan? That was our backup plan. Like I would say our last flip, um, that, that was our exit strategy and the bank will ask you that too. You know, when you're getting your, um, when you're getting your loan, they want to know if you have an exit strategy. So our, our specific extra exit strategy is um, to refinance, pull 70% out, which will cover the cost of the flip and then rent it. Got you. And then going back to Kyrie's question, right? So what, what I see, what, what JT is saying is that really, regardless of the timing, there's always good deals out there. You know what I'm saying? Right. You want to be okay. open for good deals. So speaking of that, how do you go about finding good deals? Because, you know, they say real estate, most of your money is really made on the buy. You have to that, buy, right? So, and that was so my next question. Like, how, how do you find good deals? Yep. You'd be surprised how many of my properties I actually bought off the MLS and for substantially less than it was offered for or the asking price on the MLS. So there are deals on the MLS, but I do market for all market properties. Um, as a realtor, I have the benefit of being able to pursue probate deals or foreclosures or for sale by owners or divorce. I can go into those deals of people that I know need to sell and need to sell quickly. And I can come at them with a dual proposition of saying that I buy distressed homes. I might not use the word distress, but I buy homes in order to make them into rentals. And if we can make a deal work for me to buy your home, then great. If not, I'm also a realtor and I can list your home for sale and I can tell you what you might want to do to your home to make it more valuable so it gets the top price. And usually that dual approach allows me to convert a higher number of my prospects into actual deals than would otherwise be the case. What advice would you give people like me and Kyrie or, you know, about trying to find good deals 
even and not having that advantage. You can always call me like right. well, there's nothing preventing you from partnering with an agent so that if you're marketing, if you're doing direct mail and you're doing social media and you're doing all of the different things that can get those off market deals, right? Even including door knocking, driving for dollars, all that stuff works to a degree. But if you are able to partner with a realtor and say, hey, here are the leads that I couldn't convert. They may be good for you to convert. You can create a pretty good channel of back and forth deal making so that that realtor now knows that you're the first person they need to call anytime they have a property that's about to be listed. Well, the strategy that I, I pursue is referred to on websites like Bigger Pockets as Burr, uh, buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. And so I will buy it at the best deal that I can. I will rehab it into an above average quality rental, granite countertops, LVP flooring, stainless steel appliances. I make them really nice. I rent them out oftentimes to a section eight tenant and then I refinance them pulling out 70, sometimes 75% of the appraised value as a new loan. And in most cases, that gives me enough of my money back that I have very little, if any, money still left in the deal. Many times my rate of return is infinite because there's no money left in it. I even sometimes pull out substantial amounts of cash if it was a really effective deal. Now it's been harder to do that here in 2019, 2020, but 2017, 18, it was very easy to do a flip or do a bird deal where I made more money and got to keep the property than the average flip profit. I've gone five years without having a single eviction to deal with, and it's because of how I handle tenant screening, how I handle my lease, how I handle the communication with the tenant. Literally, you can't even talk to me about a conflict on the phone. If, you, if there's something going on that you need to talk to me about a conflict, you have to do it in writing. And so it's all about that communication. From the very moment that you apply for one of my properties, there are hoops that you have to jump through that let me know if you're someone that I'm going to be able to communicate with. And the whole process of tenant screening is what saves you from having problems. Plus you do quarterly inspections to make sure that your property is being maintained well. I'm not talking about credit card debt because we went on a cruise or something of that nature. I'm talking about debt against cash flow producing assets. And we're living at a time where interest rates are the lowest that they have ever been. Literally, they've never been lower. Absolutely. They're giving away money. And if you can get a loan where basically buying a house today is like buying $5 bills for $1, <laughs> buying $100 bills for $20, because you can get a bank to give you the other $80. You just put up the 20 and they will give you a house, but you're a hundred percent owner of that house and you get to keep all the tax benefits and you get to keep all the cash flow. It's the best deal ever. So I want to rack up on as much of that debt as I can against uh, cash flow producing. Assets. Absolutely. Um, what is your net worth? If you don't mind sharing, but I understand if you don't want to share, just exciting, you know, talking about someone successful with multiple properties, <laughs> you said you have 19 properties and it's just right. wondering. What does that look like on paper? Right. Right now, my real estate holdings are valued at about $4 million. Wow. That's, that's awesome. That's Uncle awesome. Lance, let's, get, let's get started, Uncle Lance. Come on. <laughs> JT, well, what would be your advice regarding people that have small amounts of money to lend out and like how they can structure deals to do private lending with like only like 5000 say? Well, there are some scenarios where money can be pooled. I don't necessarily like pooled investments for real estate, but you can pool money. But really, if I was 27 and not married and had $5,000, I would go out and find a duplex and buy that thing with the 5,000 as my down payment and live in one unit and rent out the others. That's a mm. great way to start in real estate investing. Okay, I like that, I like that. If I had it to do over, that is what I would have done the day I got married at age 28. Yes, you don't have to just buy a single family house. You can buy a duplex, triplex, or quad. So you can literally get four units, live in one, rent out the other three, and you're already well on your way to generating wealth. And then 
when you've lived there for one year, just move to another one and do the same thing. I would be oh, moving like every that. year. Yeah, if okay, I were cool. a young person and either I wasn't married or my wife was willing to move every year. Uh, cool. I like that. Okay. Yeah, here's cool. the thing, though. So what advice would you give Kyrie regarding how to manage the tenants and stuff? I mean, I guess it goes back to your whole thing of, like, being open to pay for education and maybe take courses on, on how to, you know, deal with tenants. Okay. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Wow. Well, if I live next door to my tenants, they would never know I'm the owner. I would have a property management company. And when they say something about how the owner is this or the owner is that, I would be like, yeah, that sucks. <laughs> and they would never know it's me. I like that. I like that. So, but get, getting a property, okay, so getting a property management company, right? Okay. So, I mean, of course, if we were in North Carolina, you know, because we know you, we would love to work with you. But here in Maryland, how should we go about vetting the property management company and finding a good one to deal with? Right. First, you interview them as if you were a prospective tenant on one of their rentals. Go through the entire process, even if you want to pay for the application fee on one of their vacant properties to see how they handle that process. There's no better experience with a potential property manager than seeing firsthand how they handle their vacancies. There are websites like biggerpockets.com is an amazing resource of real estate books and webinars and podcasts. They have an amazing treasure trove of information. And I actually went back and started listening from their very first episode all the way through. I think they're in the mid 300s right now. I listen to every one of them and they all have very valuable information. That's good. That's really good. Excellent. Excellent. So what would be some of your um, goals? You know, I mean, so already you, you, you built a great real estate empire, right? And everything, a good system. <laughs> what would be some of your future goals that you are striving to obtain regarding your real estate empire? <laughs> well, when I started, I just wanted to get 10 rental properties. Um, and then I read a book called 10X. And so I increased that goal to 100 rental properties. But realistically, I think my end result is going to be buying larger apartment buildings through syndication. And so I wouldn't be surprised if I end up with thousands. Wow. Wow. That's excellent. Are you doing, how is your business structure with your rental properties? Are you doing a separate LLC for each rental property? How is that structured? No, I have um, an LLC for my new build and flipping activity. I have one for my realty agency, one for my property management firm, and then one for my rental business. And then that entity owns other entities that then own certain properties. But I don't do a one for one, one entity, one property that's just too cumbersome. What I do is I look at the amount of equity that is present within each entity and I manage that equity position so that no one entity has too much equity in it. If I were to ever get sued or something of that nature, I want to make sure that the entity doesn't have more equity than what the insurance would cover against that entity. I can't think of a better retirement plan than to have 20 or 30 cash flow producing rental properties because you always know that people are going to need a place to live. Uh, gold doesn't produce any cash flow. Stocks are volatile. Somebody could tweet something tomorrow that causes the company you own stock in to plummet in its price. It's out of your control. Of my knowledge, real estate is one of the few things where your own operation, your own insight, your own control is what is going to dictate the success or failure of your endeavor. So real estate is where it is for me the other part of it is to have cash flow producing businesses that I don't necessarily have to run myself, that I don't have to work in. 